Hello, my name is Rick Dunn and I'm with a company called Line Hall Solutions and we are a buyer's agent in the FedEx ground line hall route buying world. Now, what in the world does that mean? So you have entrepreneurs and business owners that buy FedEx ground based businesses specifically in their line hall department. If that doesn't mean anything to you, you can go check out lots of my other videos. There's plenty of information in there. And so for many years, we focused on the contractors, how to help new contractors come into our space, creating content, making sure they're successful. And that's all very true. But in doing so, we realized that for a while, we left out the very most important part of the business model, which is the drivers, the CDL drivers, the semi-truck drivers that we are reliant upon for our success. And so over the past few weeks, we have been interviewing drivers, just really getting a sense of what they feel this business means for them, for their families. Are these runs something that they appreciate? Do they want to stick around? What are they thinking about when they're out on the road? So many, including myself, entrepreneurs, small business owners, contractors for FedEx Ground Line Hall, we don't drive trucks. I never had the opportunity to drive a truck. I thought about it for a while and quickly realized that my time was better spent elsewhere. And so getting the insight from the drivers, I think is critical to really owning a successful business. Retaining drivers is immensely important. The most important aspect of the business, in my opinion, and I feel like if we're able to interact with these drivers more often, get a sense of what they're looking for, what they need in order to stick around on these runs longer to not go out into the trucking industry and to take other jobs and drive for other companies, keep them in our network. What do we need to do that that will make us all much more successful? And so today we are talking to a phenomenal dude guy named Smooth, Smooth Operator Trucking. He had a fantastic video that I just fell in love with about five pros and cons about driving at FedEx Line Hall. We've spoken, I said, man, I, I wanna do an interview with you. I wanna get on video and just get your opinion about a lot of these things that as a contractor, we think, but we're not always sure about. So I am going to bring Smooth on right now. All right, Smooth, what up, man? Welcome, What's welcome, up? how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, man. How about yourself? Very good. Very good. It's Monday, right? You catch the Super Bowl last night? I caught a little bit of it. I was working out and I only got kind of bits and pieces of it. It was exactly what you had expected to happen. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyway, man, thank you. So if you don't know who Smooth is, I urge you, pause it here and go check out our previous video. We'll link it like right here. Smooth has been a FedEx driver driving a solo run, nighttime, a very normal, typical, really good run, I think. And I believe he's gonna give us lots of insights on his life, how he became a truck driver, and I could keep talking, but that's not why we're here today. So what up, man? Tell me about your life. How did you end up driving trucks? Give me your background. All right, so I'm a second generation trucker. My dad was a truck driver, he still is. He started off in 1980 or 1981 as an owner-operator with North America. Okay. And I was born in 83, and by the time I knew what a truck was and that my dad was a truck driver, by the time I was able to recognize that my father was a truck driver, and the first time I got in the truck with my dad, he let me sit on his lap and hold the steering wheel, I was hooked. And I was probably like three or four years old. And I knew since then that's what I wanted to do. And when I was younger, I would always go on the road with my dad, and I just wanted to do everything and be like my dad, be an on operator, travel the roads. And things were a lot different in the 80s and 90s when he was doing it as on operator. He still owns trucks now, but as a company driver out of Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah, that, that's when I knew that's what I wanted to do. I just followed in his footsteps. I joined the Army when I was 18, but and I did that for 20 years. So that was a pit you, stop. You yeah. joined the Army in 2001? Uh, yes, five days before 9 11. <laughs> Yep, I was in basic training and we were still doing that <laughs> processing. And they were like, we're sending y'all to war now. We're about to cut base training short. We're sending you, you know, using scare tactics or whatever. But so, yeah, that's a story in and of itself. You're in basic training on September 11th. So I just, yep. I mean, I'm curious, like my, I was in air marshal for many years. September okay. 11th, like shaped a lot of my adult life and just the decisions that I made. So everyone has that story of how they found out. Where were you when you found out that a plane crashed into the World Trade Center? So before you get the basic training, you have to go through a process uh, in processing. So I was at Fort Benning, Georgia, 
and it was like five days before 9 11 actually happened and we were there and all of a sudden we were in process and 9 11 happened and everything stopped and then they figured out what was going on and they put us back they continued the training and pretty much just gave us a scare tactics of hey you guys could be going to war as soon as you leave here so i remember just looking up the sky and not seeing any airplanes or anything and just thinking like man like as soon as i get out of here i'm going to war when i signed up where i knew that there was a chance mm -hmm. but for it to happen mm -hmm. as soon as you sign up for it it's like wow That's here we go so basic training gets a lot more real like everything you're doing it's a lot more tangible it's like whoa we really got to learn this stuff get in shape and be ready to go absolutely impressive as hell man god that's impressive my partner darius tells the story of why he got into the air force to go play basketball and it's he got in right beforehand and then the september 11th time is up and i think he ended up doing three tours how much time did okay. you spend overseas oh well, let's see here so like i said i joined when i was 18. when i first came in the military i was an 88 mike which okay. is a truck oh. driver in the army and in the marines i think it's motor t and air force i think they just call it transportation whatever but in the army it's 88 mike well i went down range during the initial push into iraq in 2003. so i was in kuwait from probably about January, I think February, maybe I think we started pushing in in February or March. And then, and then, yeah, I was there for six months in Iraq and then did six months, left there, was away for a year, went back in 2004 to 2005 for a whole year. And then after that, I decided to leave being the 8A Mike, or I wanted to try out for Special Forces. I don't know if you ever heard of Special Forces, know what Green Berets are, but I decided that I loved what I did, but I wanted to do something that was more challenging and something that I would feel like I would have more impact. And so I tried out for Special Forces and I made it. And then there's a whole year, year and a half, two year process to get through all the training. And so then once I did that, I started deploying to Afghanistan, South America. So I've got three tours to Iraq, three tours to uh, Afghanistan and a couple of tours to South America impressive as hell man i thank you obviously for your service oh man it was an honor and the pay was good <laughs> yeah what a that's you know <laughs> oh it's the stories right you hear the the exciting stories of kind of what happened and firefights and just the terrible situations that people were in but then you hear like the goofing around stories anyway so we took a turn there but that's amazing man that's <laughs> Phenomenal story. Explain that transition, which you driving trucks, right? So you had that experience in the military, right. pre-special forces, but then where, how do you decide to leave the army and then decide to start driving trucks? Okay. So let's take it back to about 2008, 2009-ish. Like I mentioned before, my dad was a owner operator and he had a truck that was just sitting in the driveway that I grew up in pretty much. And he was thinking about getting rid of it. What was I told him to give it to me. It was a 1983 Cabo Repeater built 362. Those box, I mean, those are like, yes. If you close your eyes and you picture like an American semi truck, all of you know, that's the semi truck someone's going to picture that Pete, that boxy Pete. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was actually featured on a TV show that was coming on back in 2010, 11 called American Trucker episode four season one called special operations so so that was a pretty cool experience there when i came back from afghanistan from that tour i had enough money saved up to where i could pretty much uh redo the truck uh, and i repainted it and, and put like a superman theme on it and all that good stuff it was really cool so I, I decided to get my cdl even though at that time you didn't have to have a cdl if you were using it for non-commercial purposes but mm -hmm. i was like i might as well just go and get it and by me being in the army and already having that previous experience even though I was stationed in North Carolina, I drove down to Florida and all I had to do was take the written portion because I was grandfathered in. If you could prove that you had experience in the military yeah. driving similar trucks, then all you had to do was take the written. So that's how I got my CDL. So I've had my CDL since 2009 ish. All right, right. Fast forward to when I really decided to transition. I met a guy at a trucking show, Blue Ribbon Logistics, Larry Long. He's my mentor even to this day. He basically explained to me what trucking was like from a business standpoint. My dad showed it to me from a trucking standpoint, and he showed it to me from a business standpoint. And we linked together. I saved us some more money on one of my next tours, and I bought an older truck, 2005 Freightliner Columbia, and I had him manage it. D60? Um, and, 60 Series? Uh, yep, 60 Series. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Best, best um, engine there was in those trucks. Yeah, yeah. And so I put the truck on with Landstar and he was already an owner fleet owner at landstar and so he basically took my truck and managed it for me and it was great until i had a catastrophic failure and i didn't have enough capital saved up for it and so at that point i didn't have the experience by landstar standards to drive the truck myself if i needed to 
Plus, I was still in the Army full time. And so got past that 2017. I said, you know what? I need to start saving some more money. What can I do? And I applied for a few jobs and really nothing was kind of panning out that would get me back to my base every day. And then I said, you know what? There's a FedEx place. Let me go in there and just talk to somebody. From there, that was it. I think I started training in 2017, Thanksgiving. And at first I was doing part-time. Actually, I was really considered part-time. But like as I mentioned in my video, how I was wild man. So that's where I got the term wild man from was because the contract that I was working for then, Race Chase, I think they got bought out, but it was Race Chase out of Hope Mills, North Carolina. He had runs going to Charlotte and different places, whatever. Well, because I was part-time, I couldn't get on a dedicated run. So what I would do is I would just take whatever was left over. And mm -hmm. I made such good rapport with the coordinators in the office at Charlotte that they would pretty much give me whatever I wanted. I would go in there, I would take empties to Florence, South Carolina, from Florence, South Carolina, I would go to Charlotte. And then from Charlotte, I would do whatever they wanted me to do. And sometimes they would just give me some kind of not great runs going to Concord and back, which is only like 44 miles round trip. But I had to wait until the cut time anyways to get my load going back to Fayetteville. So I was like, why not make an extra $20? Guys, I was like, why would you do that? It's a waste of time. But I was like, that $20 adds up to extra $100, $120 at the end of the week on your check. You know what I'm saying? The one thing I kept saying was just, this guy gets it. He gets it better than I do. He gets it better than contractors do. And that's where we as contractors who aren't driving the trucks, who aren't in those small stations at 11 30 12 o'clock at night understanding mm -hmm. what's going on and maybe today it's not exactly the same because of volume issues and just everybody looking but for several years your success on the unassigned the wild man boards now as we have to call it like we're pushing mm -hmm. that term we got a character <laughs> wild man. we're coming out with thanks to you this is the originator of the term wild man right here <laughs> everyone smooth and so having someone who gets it the relationship is just it was so critical and i still think is critical because if you're sitting there and it's 11 and they got a hot load or they got something and they need someone they can count on who are they going to give it to when they've gone through the board and there's people that need to go back to their home place and maybe they could send a team on it who happens to be stuck there but there's a guy man i know this dude he's solid he's going to get it there on time i'm not going to have any nonsense he's pleasant he smiles it made and makes all the difference in the world so as a contractor if you want to be successful at night one you got to know what the hell is going on and two you have to have drivers that really embody a, a corporate culture of your business that sets mm -hmm. you apart from everybody else who also wants those runs and having a driver who gets it that's dependable that is motivated to do that for you is absolutely key to your success running at night running wild so it's impressive that you get that though we always wonder what do drivers understand well clearly they understand a lot more than we had thought so that's right. cool so yeah you were running out of a small station pensacola west in the florida panhandle and then you got on a, a dedicated solo run running to jacksonville how did that happen Okay. All right. So once I got stationed, I was stationed in North Carolina and that's when I was working for that contractor. Yep. Once I got stationed in Crestview, Florida, which is near Destin, Pensacola, that area, I reached out to a contractor there who I had actually previously talked to years before, not even knowing that this would even happen. And I was like, Hey, I'm coming to the Pensacola area. I got a year and a half before I retire. Do you have any work for me? Blah, blah. And we talked and uh, he said, yeah, I'll put you on some part-time. So at first it was kind of part-time. That's when a lot of that Ellenwood, Atlanta, I mean, Atlanta runs on a weekend was available all the time. And it was yep. perfect because I would do my army full-time during the week. And Green then runs. I was able to get, right. And I was able to get that Atlanta run, which is like 612 miles round trip. And he paid by the run. Now, obviously I'm not going to go into how much he paid because that's, you know, but it was good. It was very, for me, I was like, wow, this is amazing. It's Absolutely. just pure extra shit for him. He's got a truck that's sitting there. When he's mm -hmm. got this driver squared away dude that says, hey, I can get you at 600 miles that you won't get. Like that's worth a good chunk Absolutely. of money. Just pure yep. extra on top of what your contract is supposed to get on the schedule. Like, mm -hmm. This is just purely wow man miles that, that mm -hmm. this driver is getting for you. Absolutely. I would so, do that on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I would end up getting a little over 1800 miles on just on the weekend. And, full, and for full time pay right there for working mm -hmm. three days yep. good for you yeah all right absolutely yeah so that was amazing so and then eventually my last year in the army especially in special forces we have programs where we kind of let guys transition 
and take care of themselves. So basically, I didn't have to show up to work every day. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I was able to move into, I was still considered part-time, but I was doing full-time hours. And that's when I got on the Jacksonville from Pensacola. So basically, Pensacola to Jacksonville and back every night, I would take two empties there and bring back two loaded. And I think that was like 570 miles round trip every night. And that didn't pay as much as Atlanta, but it still paid pretty good. And then I would still do Atlanta on the weekends. I was running six days a week. So that was really awesome. That was a really good time because I was still getting my army paycheck mm -hmm. and I was getting this really, really good, actually decent paycheck from driving yeah. for the contractor Excuse out of me. Pensacola. From, from the, a contractor's uh, perspective, right? From somebody who's just has the driver. Now you have a nighttime 570 mile run. Do you know, mm -hmm. were they also covering spots during the day with that truck? Were they slip So that particular contractor, he doesn't, from my knowledge, okay. he doesn't have any spotting lanes. I know some other contractors there did have spotting during the day, but he has strictly just line hall stuff, Jacksonville, pretty much all this stuff went to Jacksonville. He had the Pensacola Jacksonville, and then he had the Panama City to Jacksonville. And like I said, anything with the Atlanta stuff was just extra on the weekends. Now he did have a short run. He had a butthead okay. that was going to shorter Alabama. So that one was only, I want to say 300 miles round trip. So some of the guys who didn't really want to work that hard did that one or whatever. It, so yeah. It, it's just for the markets and as we've seen, like FedEx makes it appealing to drivers and we'll certainly get into that. But you know, Absolutely. Hey, do you want to be home every day? Drop and hope, no touch freight. But then those runs, right, with the spots, if he's able to squeeze out six, $700 a day or more running spots and using that same truck to run your truck at night, that's where we just see the margins explode. There's nothing better in the trucking industry than mm -hmm. that run right there. That's what everybody needs to try to build, especially when you're working out of small stations where you only have the nighttime line haul. You don't have mainline stuff. So there's no teams, there's no daytime stuff running out of there, but those nighttime miles are just extremely lucrative, especially when we talk about a run like that. So you're Absolutely. Running, running to Jackson. Well, we got your tips, right? The good and the bad. And I wanna dig into some of that. When you're a okay. FedEx driver and you have experience doing outside of FedEx, Give me the best part of driving for FedEx ground line hall. So you say, man, if you're trying to recruit a driver to come work in FedEx, what are you leading with? For me, I would say the consistency and the flexibility were the two things that like that I really enjoyed having that direct relationship with my contractor. And I know some people, when they get big enough, they have enough trucks where they have a manager. And so even if you have that rapport with your manager, it just makes things a lot easier when you can go directly to your manager or your contractor and like, hey, I need this time off or can I work this day instead? And it's a lot more flexible than the rigid, I guess, kind of standards or whatever of like a FedEx Express. Nothing wrong with FedEx Express or FedEx. Obviously, there's several different types of FedEx, but to me, that's why FedEx Ground, to me, if I wanted to go back right now, I would go back to FedEx Ground just because of that reason right there, the flexibility and the consistency. And so with that, right, I got to ask the opposite ends. What's the worst? What's the part that just frustrated, annoyed you? Something that you're just like, man, this is not for me or I can't stick this out. Uh, you know, there's not a lot of things that bother me, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I always look at things as that's just business, the price of doing business, I guess. Even if, if you're driving a company truck or you're an operator for a contractor, that's the price of doing business. Nothing's ever going to be perfect. I would say the most annoying part to me was sometimes getting to a location and, and waiting past cut time. Because let's say you got there early, you took a little nap. If you got there just in time to get your 30 minutes in, or you decide to get there early and get a two hour nap in, so that way you, you're fresh on the way back. And then you get up, you're all hooked up and ready to go. And it's 30 minutes, sometimes 40 minutes or more past the cut time. And that part was the most irritating part to me that annoyed me because like, okay, they still want this load back by a certain time. And now I don't have that 15, 20, 30 minute window if I've got to stop and use the restroom or if I do get sleepy and need to shut my eyes for a couple of minutes or whatever. So that part was the most irritating part to me. Would That's you have any support trivial. when you're 30, 45 minutes late from that cut time? Would you have any options, anything you could do to talk to somebody or try to get that rectified? What I would do is I would normally call my contract. Like once I knew that he was going to be up or like, let's say that I knew they wanted that load there by 6.30. I know I probably wasn't getting there to 7, 7.30. I would start calling him around 6.15 cause I know they're going to start calling him around probably 6.45. And so I would say, Hey, it's one of those nights they didn't cut me in until late. 
and then he would let them know. And sometimes they still call, sometimes they wouldn't. And there were some nights where I just got sleepy and maybe didn't get enough rest the, the previous day and had to pull over for a few minutes longer than I anticipated. Like, hey, look, I, it was one of those nights for safety. I had to shut down for 15, 20, 30 minutes, and he, he would understand. It was very far and few between, but it does happen. So, and just think having a contractor who's available or a manager, an ops manager, someone who can take the pressure off you as a driver just to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to call ahead of time. I'm going to let your station know that you're running late and we're going to blame it on Jacksonville. They didn't cut you at times and they need to have a mm -hmm. conversation just to make sure this doesn't happen again. And that's what we want, right? You get delayed, you get frustrated, we get frustrated. And so that's obviously something that no contractor wants to wait, just like drivers don't. It's a matter right. of what you do. How do you build on something happening and creating a system to where that doesn't come up again. And that's the goal. And so for everyone watching this, like how do you interact with your drivers? And then where do you take that information and go with it? Do you go to the coordinators? Do you go with the manager? Do you call the manager of the other station? But how do we make sure that we learn from this experience so the trailers aren't late again and put it on FedEx? Hey man, you guys need these trailers. Like I wanna get these for you. Can we just make sure they cut them on time? And mm -hmm. we, you know, we get it there. And that's obvious. It's it just many times it's miscommunication. One station's not communicating with the other station. And Absolutely. so having a contractor involved in understanding what's going on there, we've seen it's important. And as you say, just taking the pressure off you, I think. You mentioned one time about the managers, the doc managers, they're trying to get the, as much freight on there as they can. Cause I mean, and I guess my biggest thing is I always try to look at things from everybody's perspective. Me as a driver, I want things to be a certain way so it makes my life easier. The uh, coordinators, they want things to be a certain way. The dock workers, I mean, I've got to places where the dock workers are sitting there waiting on you. They're looking at you like they're upset because you're running late. So sometimes it's the driver's fault. The driver gets there and these dock workers can't leave until you get there. So everybody works together in this system to make it come together like a weld oil machine. And if one little part gets kind of thrown off, then it kind of messes it up a little bit. But everybody has their thing. So you have to put yourself in other people's positions. Like I understand that every dollar counts and to maximize freight and to maximize profit, you have to get as much freight on that fuck as possible. For example, during peak season, a lot of times for like two or three months, I would get runs to Ocala. I would do that six days a week. That was like 630 Damn, something miles round trip. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That was like, that was probably my peak where I was getting paid the most because yeah. what he was paying for that and I was doing it six days a week. Mm -hmm. I was wore out at the end of the week, but I was bringing in some really, and, really and good money. Just, I don't know if, if you guys understand this, but contractors certainly do. Those peak miles, peak mm -hmm. extra, you get peak bonus. You get extra Absolutely. cents per mile to run over a threshold. So with Smooth getting those miles, that contractor's getting just pure bonus money that's dumping into mm -hmm. that. He's certainly willing to hook him up. And so peak season, aside from the recent peak season where we've had these weird, very outlier oh, yeah. situations, <laughs> It's been a great time to not just to pad your bottom line, but to take care of those drivers who are willing to go above and beyond for you and really pay them well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Me, that makes a big difference. Let me ask you this, man. Looking at this as a perspective of we have contractors who just may not be familiar with the CDL world, the driving. What? Give me an example of something that a contractor could do to take better care of their drivers, something that just maybe wouldn't think about or how do they take better care of their drivers, increase retention rates, convince people to stick around either for them or even just in the FedEx system? What can we do better? For me, I would say to just make sure that the drivers understand their importance make sure there's a good two-way communication there and yeah i mean getting paid more is nice and my contractors they were really good about safety bonuses and make sure guys are feeling fairly compensated for their time each contractor can pay differently some pay by the load some pay by the mile some pay by the hour some pay a mixture i've talked to guys when i was running to charlotte that guys were getting paid just to do dropping hooks like anytime they did a dropping hook they got paid by the mile then when they got to the facility they would get paid by the hour and then they would get paid for each drop that they made after That's the first drop whatever you know and so i was that's like right right it is <laughs> more, more i mean but like i said like that. right yeah and so i think it's all honestly is from the business side of it it's smoke and mirrors to a certain degree but you have to make and i'm not saying trick the drivers or whatever but you just have to make people feel like they're being compensated it's like i like the concept of hey you're just going to get paid this much Per run okay cool i can deal with that because it, i'm being feel like i'm being fairly compensated but let's say if you're getting paid by the mile 
but you're sitting at the facilities for three and four hours at a time and you don't have a choice because let's say you got to take a loaded trailer there it has to be there by a certain time but then you have to sit there and wait for four hours for the cut time before you can come back to your home station i saw that a lot when i was doing the runs to charlotte from fayetteville mm -hmm. unfortunately out of that small terminal they didn't have a lot of good stuff so you had to make do with what you had out of charlotte they had great stuff but out of fayetteville it just you had to make do with what it was and so i think if guys feel like they're being fairly compensated then you'll be able to retain those drivers more. I think that's the biggest thing. Okay. Is there anything you need in the truck? Like, could somebody get something off Amazon, put something in the truck that's just like, man, you know what? This sets them apart. Or is there anything you can think of that's just like, man, for such a small gesture would make a big difference? I mean, we've had some creative stuff over the years and gotten some crazy ideas, but. You know what? That's a good question. I would say from my personal experience, not really just because i just enjoy driving the truck man the truck now one okay. thing i like driving manuals and so my nope. contract would always nope. try to put me in a manual truck my uh -huh. contract would always try to put me in a manual truck so that made me happy you know yeah. now there were some nights where i had to drive an automatic it was fine i think now he only has like two manuals the rest are automatic but he always tried to put me in a manual when he could <laughs> We've had them, and I know drivers love them. And the issue is the F camera, right? The, the Ford collision okay. mitigation became mandatory. And when you had to have that, all the trucks had to get upgraded. So really now, if you're going to get a FedEx truck with F cam, you got to go 18, 19s. And how many 18s or 19s did they make as a manual transition? It was an extra Absolutely. 10 grand on top of the MSRP for that. So with that, with the lack of available manuals and newer f cam trucks on top of the fact that half the drivers coming out of school have an automatic restriction on them it's just mm -hmm. it's those days like are yeah. gone. so if you got them right. enjoy absolutely them. but eventually we're not going to have manuals in in the fedex system for sure unfortunately absolutely absolutely so, a couple quick things tell me your thoughts on the 65 miles an hour i mean when it came out it was going to be the end of the world and we were going to lose a bunch of drivers <laughs> It's mandatory 65. What are your thoughts on that? I think the industry changes and you have to kind of uh, go along with the industry. Like I said, again, the price of doing business. I wasn't crazy about it when I was driving the 65 mile long truck. Now some contractors, this is just between me and you, okay? But some contractors will try to turn the trucks up a little bit and they'll see what they can get away with and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes they get caught. I've heard of guys getting caught like guys Terrifying. going to Ellenwood and, and doing 74, 75 miles an hour. And that just happens to be a terminal manager that sees that and then calls that contract. I'll say, hey, you need to turn those trucks down to 65 miles an hour or you're going to lose your oh, contract. Yeah. And so when you look at the big scheme of things, it's like, okay, yeah, I want to make my drivers happy, but my drivers aren't going to be happy if they don't have a, a job to come to. So is it better to keep the trucks turned up to keep your drivers happy or is it better to just you know, comply with FedEx's 65 it's mile an hour rule so everybody stays employed? So. For, for the drivers watching this, we as contractors do not want to slow the speeds of the truck. We want to give you what you want. We are fine with you driving 71, 72, especially in markets where you have the speed limit where you're allowed to go. It's a FedEx mm -hmm. rule. And it's not just a FedEx rule. This is going to be a DOT federal mandated speed limiter on trucks. I'm guessing it's May and I'm predicting it's going to be 67, 68 miles per hour. They're going to slow the entire <laughs> industry down and it's DOT. It's going through Congress like it's going to happen. And so everyone else is going to catch up to as well. I'm not saying it's good. It's I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying it is what it is and we just deal with it. And so it's not us. If you get a speeding ticket going faster than 65, everyone's going to say, oh, he was going downhill. Now, if you're going faster than 70, that's going to be a problem. And yes, a contractor is open to losing his contract and not being able to do business with FedEx over that issue. So for me, I think you're crazy to let your trucks go faster. Just my two cents, but to each his own. And the market's going to dictate it. And you know how many times you get pulled over and, and you know better than I do what's going on in your particular market. So have at it. Cameras in the trucks. What are your thoughts? It doesn't really bother me. I mean, if you're doing the right thing, then it doesn't really bother me. I, I know a lot of guys, they'll flip their visors down or whatever. You could probably get away with that here and there sometimes, but no, as, as long as you're process, doing the right that's, thing. No, God, Yo, no. And yeah. just so you <laughs> understand, and so for any drivers watching this, those cameras directly tie into the deductible that you pay on your insurance. So mm -hmm. if there is a, a major event, 
50, 75, hundred thousand dollars worth of damage, and you don't have a camera of what the driver was doing at that time, your deductible goes from like $2,000 up to 15, up to $35,000 in that situation. So we as contractors, I mean, the second you see that it's one of those things where you just can't play with it. Unfortunately, the cameras right. are no, there. No, no. And it makes they're sense. They're not going yeah. anywhere. Yeah. So fl the flipping yeah. down the visor, that's a one time. It's a one strike rule. Hey, I know I get it. We're not watching you. But just so you know, this can't happen. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, the camera didn't bother me at all. Yeah. Thank you for your time today. And, and we're going to talk again. I have 19 topics that we have to immediately follow up on. But I want to <laughs> thank you for your insight on FedEx ground specifically. Hopefully anybody watching this, you get a better understanding from a driver who gets it. But you're not driving in FedEx line hall right now. So what happened? What made you leave? So I've always wanted to be over the road truck driver and I always wanted to own my own truck. And as soon as I retired officially from the military, I was able to do that. And so basically now I'm an own operator for a company. I choose my own loads. I go where I want to go. And, that, and that's what I've always wanted to do. And you know, the cool part about that is this truck that I'm in right now, it's a 2007 Freightliner Columbia Detroit 60. My last contractor gave it to me. He had to you know, obviously start getting trucks out of the system. Mm -hmm. First, he was going to sell it to me. And he said, hey, if you stay with me through peak season this year, I'll just give it to you. Now, it needed an overhaul on it, but that's fine. You get a truck that needs a fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 overhaft and maybe put another 10000 into it. When it's good to go, psh, why not? And so it was perfect. He, he set me up perfectly. That was because of the rapport that we built. And so, yeah, the re that's the only reason why I left was because I always wanted to be an owner operator. If it wasn't for that, I would still be at FedEx Ground. I loved it. I liked it. Like I said, the consistency of it, the pay was pretty good and I enjoyed it. So is the goal to add more, you can add another truck, hire people. Yes. Okay. So you're yes, growing, the goal, you're the goal, the empire. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yep. Great for you, man. All right. So you have your own authority. No, I don't have my own authority. I'm on okay. operator, leased to a company. Yeah. Got it. Leased on. Is yeah. the goal to get your own authority? You know, the, uh, right now I'm a big believer in high reward, low risk, keep your expenses low, keep your revenue high. And right now, to me, I don't see the advantage of having my own numbers. Maybe somewhere down the line. I just think there's a lot you have to do. Have at least 50000 plus saved up in the bank for maintenance or whatever else. Try to have a direct contract. To me, if you live off the low board, you can do it. But for me, I'd want to have at least a direct contract out of where I'm stationed at. And then maybe find freight off the low board coming back for my backhaul. But I just think a lot of guys go into it not really understanding everything that encompasses it. Everything that you have in a one truck fleet running under your own numbers is the same thing that the guys who have 20,000, 30,000 trucks have to abide by. So now you're the driver, you're the coordinator, you're the dispatcher, you're the safety, you're the drug and you have to do all that. And it's really hard to comply with constant new regulations. Will I do it one day? Maybe when I feel comfortable and, and, and I'm ready to step into that. But right now I'm just comfortable growing inside of a, another company. So that way I have that umbrella, the, the, the fuel discounts, the tire discounts. There's so many different things that the already contracted freight that's there. So uh, nothing against people who have their own authority. It's just right now, I think the, the risk is higher than the reward right now. Good point. All right. So cool, man. I get it. And as long as you're out there making money, stack it, man. Great for you. Thank you for your time today. Honestly, this has been invaluable. I think the insights you're able to provide, I'd love to talk to you again very soon. I want to hear about your adventures. Just start being your own boss, being an owner operator. Can we have that conversation Absolutely. very soon? Absolutely. I would love that. Yes. Awesome. Any questions you have? I mean, for me as a contractor, anything you've been cur curious about, I like to preach transparency. Well, let's see here. Obviously, it's always kept under wraps about what is like the price range of like, because like we talked about, I talked about my video about the consistency of it. I don't know if the pay might not be that great that before after fuel surcharge, but it's like, obviously each lane is probably a little different, but what is like the range? I used to do the math as I was driving down the road, like, man, he's paying me X amount of dollars. I just put X amount of dollars in the fuel tank. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you, it's a mileage rate that you get. Now, different markets have slightly different rates, like the New York Metro market will have a higher mm -hmm. rate than say the Alabama market, just for the cost of living. The fuel okay. surcharge is part of that. So the good thing about being a FedEx contractor 
is as fuel adjusts, you're not overly concerned with it as much as you are as an owner operator. Like it's directly mm -hmm. correlated to your margins. But for us, mm -hmm. when fuel prices go up, we get more money in a fuel surcharge. So we get more revenue from the business. Now, mm -hmm. what does that mean? If you look at how much money you make in revenue, you want your fuel surcharge to be 24 to 28, 29%. That's where it's healthy. When it got really expensive there in 22, it spiked mm -hmm. up to maybe 32, 33%. That's when it started really eating into margins. But okay. All in all, as a contractor, you're not overly obsessed with fuel other than making sure you're fueling up at the best possible locations with an REL fuel card at the mm -hmm. FedEx hubs or at the TA or pilot, whatever's giving you the best discount. Now for a money reason, I don't know what it's funny. Like I should know, I think it's like a dollar 80 to maybe 220 a mile that you're getting consistently depending on the run, the shorter runs pay more money. So if right. you're running 10 miles and back, you're getting a higher mileage rate than you are on your Jacksonville run because they got to incentivize you to take the short runs. Teams mm -hmm. are getting more per mile, might be 10 cents, whatever it is, than your solo runs. But all in all, I mean, a healthy business, you want your payroll ratio, I think ideally on a solo nighttime run like you're talking about, 35% is how much you're paying the driver of the revenue of that run. Now that can go up to 40, 45% in certain markets, depending on mm -hmm. what you're willing to pay for those runs and competition, the driver market at the time, everything comes into play right now. There's not a lot of great runs out there for CDL drivers. Freight rates have come down a lot. So we're mm -hmm. seeing a lot more drivers willing to take these home, especially the home daily runs than mm -hmm. we were maybe two years ago. So hopefully payroll ratios from a business perspective have come down a little bit if possible. But yeah, okay. great question. I don't want to dance around it, but I look at it as ratios, right? How much of right. my money am I paying you to cover that run for me? Now, for someone like you who makes it to where if I don't have to wake up at night because I know you're taking care of it for me, I'll give you more money. Mm -hmm. That's for me, if I'm paying a guy, let's say that run you're getting for five nights a week, 1600 bucks, right? Let's just mm -hmm. say. The difference between me having to wake up at two in the morning to make sure I'm getting calls and then I get a call at six o'clock in the morning because you're not there versus mm -hmm. not having that, I'm willing to give you more money to not get those phone calls. And I'm building a business mm -hmm. around having a dispatching team, having managers, having drivers that allow me to sleep. And that's just me because I get really whiny when I don't right. get my 11 hours. <laughs> Great question. We're going to talk again. And anything that pops up, man, I want to talk. But next conversation, let's dig more into outside the FedEx stuff. Your transition, getting a truck and some things that you encounter out on the road because you're out. I mean, you're in Oregon right now, correct? Um, let's see. I'm in Montana right now. Yeah. Okay. So yep. you're out yep. traveling the country. So that I want to hear some stories from that and follow up with you and get some goals if that's something you're going to do forever, if it's short term. So let's dig in, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Very much. This is phenomenal. We'll be in touch. Talk to you soon. It was an absolute pleasure. All right. Take it easy.